Many of us grew up reading his tales on self-destruction, revenge, and violence. Tales of premature burials of ghastly cats and ravens where the line between the living and the dead is never clear. But when you look deeper into the life and works of Edgar Allan Poe, a more complex figure emerges. Beyond the traditional image of the alcoholic, pale, sickly author who has an obsession with death. Poe's life it was not easy, and in many ways it was tragic, and his path crossed the Grim Reapers many times. But in today's biographics, we're going to look at another angle of Poe. The athletic military man, the rebellious student, the ruthless reviewer, the father of detective fiction. And to satisfy those with morbid fantasies, we're going to investigate the mystery behind his death. Edgar Poe was born on the 19th of January 1809 in Boston from David and Elizabeth to traveling actors. Edgar's life had barely started when he suffered a double trauma. On the December 1811, Elizabeth died of illness, perhaps pneumonia or tuberculosis, which were both highly prevalent in the US at the time. David died within a few days of his wife. And the details about that are largely unknown. According to one account, David was performing in Norfolk, Virginia with his traveling theater company when he also died of an illness. A different account tells us that by the time of Elizabeth, Elizabeth's death, the Poe family was a broken one. David left the household, leaving his wife destitute. Six days after his mother's death, the orphaned Edgar was fostered into the home of John and Francis Allen of Richmond. His sister Rosalie was taken in by the Mackenzie family, also of Richmond, while big brother Henry remains with his grandparents in Baltimore. John and Francis Allen were a childless couple, and although they never legally adopted Edgar, they considered him to be their son. Edgar called them Pa and Ma. John was a wealthy merchant, a self-made man from Scotland. While Edward's relationship with Francis would always be deeply affectionate, him and John would frequently clash. On the 7th of January 1812, Edgar was baptized as Edgar Allan Poe. The Allan family, with Edgar in tow, later moved to London, where they lived from 1815 to 1820. During these years, the young Edgar learned grammar, Latin, Greek, and, surprise, dancing. The Allens returned to America in 1820, and by 1823, Edgar was studying in a school run by one William Burke. No, not the body snatcher of Burke and Hare fame, just a namesake, but if you'd like to learn more about Burke and Hare, we absolutely have a video on them. We kind of imagine the modern equivalent of this would be Stephen King graduating from Ed Gein High. Poe was a very active and athletic teenager, contradicting the common image of the sickly, brooding intellectual. In the summer of 1824, he became famous for swimming seven miles up the James River against a heavy tide. That's almost three times the swimming segment of an Ironman competition. Apparently, Schoolmaster Burke followed him in a boat in case he needed help. Maybe that's what got Edgar going. Being chased by a Scottish serial killer on a boat is a pretty powerful motivator. But remember, it wasn't actually him, it was just a namesake. Later that year, Edgar authored his first poem of just two lines. Last night, with many cares and toils oppressed, weary, I laid me on a couch to rest. Which can be paraphrased as, I am going to take a nap on the sofa. In February of 1826, Edgar enrolled in the University of Virginia, Charlottesville. But his studies there, they were short-lived. The wealthy John Allen had no intention to fill Edgar's pockets with easy money, so the freshman had to subsidize his expenses with a side hustle, and that was gambling. Edgar accumulated $2,000 of gambling debts, which is more than $50,000 in today's money. John Allen refused to pay, leading to a rift between the two men, a situation which would occur again in the future. That year, Edgar couldn't really catch a break. During Christmas holidays, he was looking forward to reuniting with his childhood sweetheart and prospective fiancée, Elmira Royster. But Elmira's parents had pressured her into dumping him for a wealthy and solid businessman, Alexander Shelton. It's understandable that in 1827, Edgar decided to leave university and reunite with his older brother Henry in Baltimore. Still in need of a steady income, in May, Poe enlisted in the U.S. Army under the name Edgar A. Perry. Private Perry did well in the army and rose to the rank of sergeant major of an artillery regiment in less than two years. Not only that, but he also found time to write his first book of poetry. This was Tamerlane and Other Poems, and it was published with the pseudonym A Bostonian. This booklet sold about 50 copies. If you come across a copy of Tamerlane in your great-great-grandparents' attic, you could probably auction it for around $172,000. On the 28th of February, 1829, Francis Allen, Ma, died from a respiratory illness, just like Edgar's biological mother. In the following years, Edgar's behavior 
behavior, it became erratic and rebellious, probably as a consequence of Ma's death. Now, initially, Poe seemed to like army life. In April of 1829, he applied to the West Point Academy, looking forward to a promotion from sergeant to lieutenant. He entered the academy in the summer of 1830, but by the following winter, he was doing his best to get kicked out. Once a talented cadet, Poe racked up 110 offenses and 106 demerits in two terms. He was court-martialed and tried at the beginning of February 1831 for gross neglect of duty. So what was the cause for his rebellion? Again, it all came from his relationship with John Allen. Pa had remarried, perhaps too quickly, with Mrs. Louisa Patterson, who Poe disliked. Moreover, Edgar discovered that John had sired children out of wedlock. The feud was embittered by a letter written by Poe in which he claimed that John Allen was seldom sober. Edgar wanted to leave West Point to pursue writing at this stage, but he needed John's authorization for a voluntary discharge. When John, now cold and distant, refused, Edgar started his self-sabotaging campaign. He succeeded and was kicked out of the army, but not before collecting donations from 100 cadets to fund his next book of poems, which was simply titled Poems. In the summer of 1831, fate dealt another blow to Edgar as it claimed the life of his brother Henry, yet another victim of tuberculosis. Edgar's writing career started to pick up in the early 1830s, and his short story, Message Found in a Bottle, won a $50 prize from a Baltimore magazine in 1833. The prize was very welcome as John had closed the coffers, and his second wife Louisa did not approve of Edgar, and the couple now also had a biological son, likely to inherit Alan's wealth. In 1834, John fell ill. When Edgar heard the news, he tried to reunite with him one last time. They had not seen each other since West Point. Edgar rushed to Richmond, overcame Louise's resistance, and finally came face to face with the now terminal Pa. Thomas Ellis, John's business partner, described the tearful reunion. With what little strength was left in him, John stood up. So did they hug? Oh no. John raised his cane and threatened to strike him if he came within his reach. It was the last time they ever met. John Allen died on March the 27th, 1834, and his will it makes no mention of Poe. In the second half of the 1830s, Poe's writing career it took off. Or rather, he was always employed, but he had little fame and even less money. Following his ma's death in 1829, Edgar had developed a friendship with his cousin, Virginia Clem, 13 years his junior. Virginia was the daughter of Maria, who was the sister of David Poe. So she was a first-degree relative of Edgar's via his biological father, not his foster family. This relationship was initially an innocent one, with Virginia acting as a go-between for Edgar and a girl called Mary Devereux, who he was trying to woo. By 1835, when Poe was 26 and Virginia only 13, the friendship was developing into something else. Despite Virginia's relatives' best attempts, on the 22nd of September 1835, Edgar and Virginia married in secret, celebrating a public wedding the following year. Edgar even took in his aunt and mother-in-law, Maria Clem. He nicknamed her Muddy for some reason, and apparently loved her as a mother, addressing her as such in a poem. And fun fact here, after Poe's death, Maria was completely destitute and was relying on charitable donations, and among the donors was one Charles Dickens. Going back to Edgar and Virginia, a marriage at such a young age would certainly not be acceptable by today's standards, and even back then it was frowned upon. But some authors claim that Edgar's and Virginia's relationship it may have been purely platonic. The theory is that after the death of both his biological and foster mothers, Poe had transferred his feelings of filial love to Aunt Mary, and in turn, to Virginia. You can draw a parallel with Poe's work at this stage, namely the short story of Morella of April 1835. In this story, an unnamed narrator regards, with a feeling of deep yet most singular affection, my friend Morella. The two marry, and Morella grows obsessed with death and issues of identity. She dies in childbirth, and the protagonist decides to leave the baby girl unnamed for ten years. As she grows older, she is uncannily unlike her mother. When the girl turns ten, the father agrees to have her baptized. When he chooses the name Morella, the girl immediately dies, uttering, I am here. The tale concludes, With my own hands I bore her to the tomb, and I laughed with a long and bitter laugh as I found no traces of the first in the channel where I laid the second. Morella. The tale features Poe's recurring topics of resurrection and identity beyond death. And consider this. The narrator and Morella are friends before marrying, just like Edgar and Virginia. And then, here is a transfer of identity from mother to daughter, which opens the door to more Freudian nightmares than we could possibly handle in today's video. Morella and the husband in the tale, they had a happy marriage, so how was Edgar's and Virginia's? Apparently, it was successful despite lack of money. Virginia had a deep adoration towards Poe and always kept his portrait under her pillow. Edgar, on the other hand, had started flirting with one Francis Sergeant Osgood, but besides exchanging letters, there is no proof of relationship. 
Francis was being unsuccessfully courted by another author and journalist, Rufus W. Griswold, keep an eye on him. These letters were enough to enrage another lady, Elizabeth Ellis, who had a crush on Pope. Her reaction caused a scandal as she alleged Poe and Francis had a physical affair. She even spread rumors that Poe was subject to acts of lunacy. Virginia was unconcerned with Poe's flirtations, but this scandal affected deeply her frail health. In the second half of the 1830s, Poe went full workaholic, moving frequently across East Coast cities looking for work in magazines. He did not neglect his creative writing, though, publishing his first known novel, The Narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym, in 1838. In the following two years, Poe published two works, his seminal collection of groundbreaking short stories, Tales of the Grotesque and Arabesque, and a treatise on Shellfish, the conchologist's first book, which he co-authored. One of these two books sold out in two months, and you could probably guess which one it was. Nope, it was the shellfish one. Not even joking. I'm not going to comment on the taste of American readers in the 1830s, but, well, this was actually Poe's only commercial success in his lifetime. A book about shellfish. In 1841, Poe took a position as an editor for Graham's magazine, which he also used as a platform for his own short stories. Poe grew the circulation of the magazine from 5,000 to 37,000 subscribers. Poe even convinced Charles Dickens to write for the Graham. But in May, Poe left the magazine, handing over his duties to Rufus W. Griswold. Remember him? Poe wrote to a friend, My reason for resigning was disgust with the Namby Pamby character of the magazine. The salary, moreover, did not pay me for the labor which I was forced to bestow. By that time, Virginia had already fallen ill to tuberculosis, some say as a consequence of the Ellet scandal. Her health worsened, but Poe did not stop on his streak. He was finally going places. In 1843, Poe's tale, The Goldberg, won a $100 prize from a Philadelphia newspaper. It was followed by a theatrical production and a French translation, giving Poe some deserved public attention. He embarked on a tour of sold-out poetry lectures, moved to New York, and was a sub-editor of the Evening Mirror. It was this paper that in January 1845 published his most famous poem, The Raven. It became an immediate nationwide hit. So what princely sum did Poe earn for this masterpiece? Well, that would be $15, or about $325 in today's money. In February, Poe took control and ownership of the Broadway Journal, but this did not help him financially. If anything, he accumulated even more debt, and the journal shut down in January the next year. Things started to pick up thanks to royalties from publication about New York's literary scene, but life giveth and it taketh away. Virginia's condition it worsened, and by early 1846 she was bedridden. She told a friend, I know I shall die soon, but I want to be as happy as possible and make Edgar happy. On the 30th of January 1847, Virginia Poe died of tuberculosis in Fordham, New York. On her deathbed, it is claimed that Virginia blamed her death on the jealous Mrs. Allett. Poe's love for Virginia, it was consuming, as was his grief. For almost two years, he visited her grave every day, keeping it fresh with flowers. So what future lay ahead of Edgar Allan Poe now that his beloved Virginia was gone? But let's pause this man's life for a while and dig into his work a bit. Poe is remembered as a master of horror and father of the modern short story. He composed his tales following two main rules. Each story should be short enough to read in one sitting, and each word should contribute to the overall effect of the story. His published work came at the apex of the Gothic and Romantic periods and had a great influence in Europe, where he was idolized by Charles Baudelaire and the movements of the French poet Maudy. Beyond horror, his body of work encompasses many other genres, and in most cases, it's not easy to define. Take the short story, The Duc de l'Homme a French aristocrat and Gourmand dies of disgust when a delicacy is improperly served to him. He wakes up in hell and starts plotting his way out. He challenges Satan to a duel, but alas, the Prince of Hell does not fence. The next best thing is a nice game of 21, or blackjack if you like. Satan cannot refuse a game of cards, so challenge accepted. The Duke, a skilled gambler, wins the game and his freedom. In four pages, Poe defines two characters, sets up a conflict, establishes some devilish lore along the way, and crosses three genres – comedy, horror, and subtle satire of European aristocracy. Another crossover of styles he achieved was with The Murders of the Rue Morgue. There is some horror also here with a killing perpetrated by a monstrous assailant. But most of all, this tale is the first detective story. Poe established the basic archetypes of this genre. 
The same collection, Tales by E. A. Poe, features the gold bug. This uh, slash detective romp tells the story of a narrator, his volatile friends, Legrand, and a freed slave, Jupiter, who decipher an encrypted message to find a pirate treasure. The story is best remembered for Legrand's use of frequency analysis to crack the code and for the depiction of Jupiter. To modern ears, it's pretty damn racist. But assigning an important speaking role and a great deal of action to a black character in 1840s America was seen as a rather progressive move. Much of Poe's writing career was dedicated to reviews of other authors. As a literary critic, Poe celebrated the works of Washington Irving and Nathaniel Hawthorne, among the classics of American literature, but he was known and feared for how he destroyed less skilled authors. This earned him the nickname of the Tomahawk Man. Tackling the poems of one William W. Lord, Poe opines that the only remarkable things about Mr. Lord's compositions are their remarkable conceit, ignorance, imprudence, platitude, stupidity, and bombast. From any farther specimens of your stupidity, good lord, deliver us. Novelists were no luckier. Theodore S. Fay's 1835 work Norman Leslie was unworthy of a schoolboy. There is not a single page of Norman Leslie in which even a schoolboy would fail to detect at least two or three gross errors in grammar and some two or three most egregious sins against common sense. The one who gets the full tomahawk treatment is Morris Matson's novel Paul Ulrich. The book before us is too purely imbecile to merit an extended critique, but we shall have no hesitation in exposing fully before the public eye its 443 pages of utter folly, bombast, and inanity. But Poe was not done yet. Such other works which bring daily discredit upon our national literature works of incongruous folly, plagiarism, immorality, inanity, and bombast. Poe also attacked fellow journalists, editors, and critics. The editor of Boston Miscellany, H.T. Tuckerman, was was an insufferable, tedious, and dull writer, while critic Rufus W. Griswold was dismissed as a toady destined to sink into oblivion. Yep, same Griswold as before, right there. Poe's reputation still today is one of a heavy drinker, but it actually was only after Virginia's death that he gave into alcohol. And even then, he never really drank in huge quantities. The problem was that even a small quantity of liquor, it could knock him out. In November of 1848, Poe was courting poetess Sarah Helen Whitman, no relation to Walt Whitman. She was so concerned about his reputation for drinking that she asked for total abstinence from alcohol as a condition of marriage. Poe failed to meet the request, and Sarah called off the engagement. In the summer of 1849, Poe was on a lecture tour in Rich when he again met his once girlfriend Elmira, the one who had dumped him for the businessman. Elmira was now a widow, and the two rekindled their love affair. In August, Elmira accepted Edgar's proposal. And Poe must have been dead serious about it, as only two days later he joined the Sons of Temperance, a sort of Alcoholics Anonymous for the 19th century. Everything was working out fine, and then the chain of events started that would lead to Poe's unresolved death. On the 26th of September 1849, Poe visited a physician friend called John Carter. He was due to leave Richmond, Virginia, to go to Philadelphia to complete an editing job. Carter advised Poe to postpone his trip by a few days, but he decided to leave anyway. On the 27th of September 1849, Poe left Richmond for Philadelphia. For the following six days, he just vanished. A journalist called Joseph Walker, walking outside the pub Gunners Hall, came across a traumatized man lying in the gutter. The man was visibly ill, in a state of confusion, and dressed in worn-out, ill-fitting clothes. The man introduced himself as Edgar Allan Poe and asked for help. Poe asked Walker to contact one Joseph Snodgrass, a newspaper editor with a medical background. Snodgrass took Poe to a hospital where he was treated by Dr. John Morin. Morin noted down his patient's symptoms – fever, mania, revulsion to water, and calling for somebody called Reynolds. Moran also asked Poe where he had left his possessions, but the writer he could not remember. On the 7th of October 1849, Edgar Allan Poe died at the age of 40. The reported cause of death was phrenitis or swelling of the brain. His mother-in-law, hearing Poe had died, went to check on his cat Katerina and found out that she had also died. One of the early reported causes of Poe's death was alcohol abuse. This unverified rumor was spread by Poe's obituary, more on that a bit later. Other possible causes include tuberculosis, epilepsy, diabetes, and even rabies. The latter may actually be consistent with Katerina's death. Author Matthew Powell offered another explanation brain cancer. This is consistent with the symptoms. Plus, when Poe's body was displaced to another burial in 1875, the coffin broke and witnesses noticed a small clump rolling inside Poe's skull. This could have been a calcified tumor. Other theories involve violent crime. 
Poe may have been assaulted, beaten up by ruffians, as claimed in 1867 by biographer E. Oak Smith, but Poe's body it did not display any signs of violence. Another criminal theory involves cooping. This was a common type of electoral fraud at the time. Gangs of thugs would abduct and coup up citizens from the streets and force them into a disguise so they could vote several times for the same candidate. The victims were threatened with violence or rewarded with alcohol. Intriguing theory mentioned for the first time in the early 1970s, and there are some points in its favor. Baltimore at that time was in the middle of a local election. Gunners Hall was a polling station. Poe was wearing somebody else's clothes. Finally, Baltimore's newspaper, The Republican and Argus, published warnings against cooping on the 1st and 3rd of October. So we searched the enigmatic name Reynolds in local Marion newspapers, and we found that in September there were two people called Reynolds acting as district delegates in Elkton, just outside of Baltimore. Could they be involved in the local Baltimore elections? Was this a name that Poe heard or read while being cooped? We also spoke with an oncology surgeon, formerly one of London's biggest cancer centers, who we will just call Dr. M. Dr. M confirms that tumor masses can and calcify even when the surrounding healthy tissue decomposes. They offered an additional explanation for the clump rolling around inside his head, and that would be head trauma. Not only can it cause death, but it can also cause a small bone between the cheekbone and the jaw to fracture and detach. At this point, it would be free to rattle around inside the skull. A blunt trauma at the back of the head would not leave injuries, and Poe's body did not display any sign of violence. There aren't many more theories, so I'm just going to stop here. Guns of the Head here would probably go with cooping plus blunt trauma, but let us know your theory in the comments. On the 9th of October 1849, an obituary of Poe's appeared in the New York Tribune, signed Ludwig. We don't know if Poe's death was an assassination, but certainly this article was a character assassination. While praising Poe's work, Ludwig wrote that few will be grieved by his death, and that the writer had little to no friends, and led a dissolute and dissipate life. Ludwig would publish yet more articles praising Poe the author while destroying Poe the man, exaggerating or inventing embarrassing details. These articles were now signed with his real name, Rufus W. Griswold. The irony is that Griswold was Poe's executor, meaning he had the rights to edit and publish his works for a nice profit, and he did all this while cementing the image of the dissolute and lunatic alcoholic that still survives to this day. So I really hope you learned something new about Edgar Allan Poe today. Please do share this video with a friend if you fancy it. Now we had to skip tons of stuff here in this video, of course, but if you want to dig deeper, check out the website of the Edgar Allan Poe Society of Baltimore at eapoe.org. It's a real mine of free material, including his full works. And if you hear somebody repeating one of Griswold's lives, well, just like Poe's raven, just say nevermore.